Spirit of the living God. For the word says that you are spirit. And wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. There's freedom. And Father, we thank you for it. There's freedom from anything that doesn't look like you. There's freedom from chaos, freedom from turmoil, freedom from addiction. You are the king of glory. You are omnipotent. You are omniscient. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us a freedom, for giving us a hope, for giving us a place where we can cry out unto you with no shame, no judgment. Your presence to encounter you. What greater thing does creation need but an encounter with you? Revival starts with an encounter with you. Salvation starts with an encounter with you. Deliverance starts with an encounter with you. Healing is a thing that is an encounter with you. Jesus, we love you. Thank you is all I can say. I give you my life as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is all of our reasonable service. Thank you, Jesus, this morning for laying out the spread. The table is present and the chairs are there. And I pray this morning, Father, that we could all take our seat at your table. That you've prepared for us a place of worship and the ability to tabernacle among you. Oh God, we just love you. My prayer this morning is that your word would reach the inner depths of our soul. That transformation would not only be an idea, but it would become a reality in the life of your people. Father, that you can even take our understanding beyond where it is on today. That for you, just giving us the ability to walk into this house this morning and to call on your name is a blessing all by itself in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. To help us understand, Father, that we deserve eternal damnation and to forever be separated from you, but thank God that you've made peace with us. And now that we all are justified by faith and the veil has been torn, There's a mercy that pushes us into your arms and a grace that meets us right where we are. So Father, again, hide me far behind your cross that your message, your gospel, your word, your truth and all of who you are would be the only thing that people would receive on this day. Set the record straight. You are the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Father, we put all our trust in you. Take us to where you want to take us to. And I promise, regardless of where we end up and how we get there, that you'll be the same God to receive all the praise, all of the honor, and all of the glory. Why? Because it already belongs to you. In Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Give God praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be seated this morning in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you glad to be alive this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God for Jesus Christ. I'm telling you now, his presence is among us. And if you can believe it, whatever you need, it's in the room this morning. I thank God for worship being that, that vehicle, that hallelujah, that drives us into the presence of the Almighty. And these men and women that labor uh, very intensely and intently every a single week uh, to bring us into God's presence and to invite him in. And I'm grateful for it. And it's going to make a little bit more sense as we dive into the word of the Lord this morning. And I want to I want to say something. And this is not my message. This is not the word. But I just want to encourage and kind of admonish at the same time. But my desire is that we could learn, and this is a learned behavior, I believe, for Christians, especially in America, but that we could learn that when we come into God's presence, not just here uh, in the house, but wherever we are at home or on our jobs, wherever we invite the Spirit of the Lord, that we could expect and have a faithful expectation. Say amen. There's something about having a faithful expectancy to encounter Christ. I think about, and I'm 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 going to try not to go here, help me, Holy Spirit, Uh, but uh, the gospel of St. Mark in chapter 2, in the very beginning, we know the Bible says that Jesus is entering Capernaum again, meaning that he's already gone there before, and that the people in Capernaum are hearing about his entry into the city. And the Bible says that crowds begin to feel and they hear about them and it travels and it breaks the internet and Twitter's blowing up and Facebook's going crazy that Jesus is coming to Capernaum. It's all over the headlines and Fox and CNN. Everybody is hearing about it. And there's a group of friends and one being a paralytic uh, from the waist down, I would assume he could not walk. He had no activity of the lower part of his limbs. And the Bible says that they go to meet Jesus, but they wake up that morning hearing about it and they already on their way to Jesus have faithful expectancy. The word says that they got on top of the roof, Sister Christie. Now, if you know anything about Capernaum and the way that these houses were constructed, they weren't like what we are accustomed to here in America. And that when they got this lifeless body on top of the roof, the Bible then says that they tear the roof off. Now, this isn't two and three tap shingle. This isn't tongue and groove OSB and and your roof truss. See, I've been doing my homework, brother. (laughs) Praise God. It, It wasn't but that simple that these houses were designed a little bit different. But the Bible says that they broke open the roof. And I can't imagine the labor and the effort that it took to break open the roofs that were designed in the days of Christ. But when they broke the roof, the word says that Jesus was preaching. They were having church and that it was so crowded. But nevertheless, they knew that Jesus was preaching the word that they lowered him down in the presence. Jesus stopped the sermon and right in the middle of preaching, he said, it is your faithful expectancy and he didn't even heal his body. The Bible says that Jesus says your sins are forgiven first. And it caused some uproar that I won't get into exegetically this morning with the Pharisees and some of the religious leaders. His body was healed second, 
but his sins were forgiven first. And as much as we think it's an outward healing, Jesus is more concerned with the inward healing. For in fact, he says he would rather that you enter into the kingdom of God maimed and broken like a dog or an animal that that doesn't have full activity of their limbs than to enter into the gates of hell with full activity from top to bottom. That they had an expectancy that was filled with faith. And that is what, ladies and gentlemen, got the attention of Jesus Christ. Imagine what could happen on Sunday morning on Monday through Saturday, if you could have that type of faithful expectation, because it is that type of faithful expectation on a collision course with Christ, there is no telling through the power and the love of our Father what could take place in the life of the sons and daughters of the Most High God. Come on and give God praise. Hallelujah. The book of Revelation this morning, chapter three. If you have your Bibles, please join me. Revelation, it is a singular revelation with many details. And while you get a place marker in the third chapter of the book of Revelation, I want you to go to chapter 11 in the book of Revelation and put a place marker there as well. Revelation chapter three and Revelation chapter 11. Some of you already know or may not know, but we've been walking uh, with Jesus on what I like to call almost like a postal route that Jesus is making through these seven lap stands or these seven churches that are in Asia Minor during the apocalyptic period. And Jesus, if you know from the beginning, he's very serious. He's always been serious, but he's very serious and very detailed when it comes to his bride, that there are certain things of expectation that Jesus is expecting from us as the bride and the body of Christ. That I told you from the beginning that the book of Revelation from beginning to end, from chapter one all the way to chapter 22, is a book of entirety full with not only power, but of promise and of prophecy. And this is something I want you to really hang on to very dearly this morning. And as we make our route, we've dealt with the church in Ephesus. We've dealt with the church, the letter written to Thyatira, And now this morning, we're going to walk to the letter written to the church in Laodicea. Very powerful. And Jesus has a lot to say. And listen, what I'm asking, I'm asking the Holy Spirit a lot this morning. And I can ask the Holy Spirit a lot because he can handle a lot. Say amen. Amen. And uh, I'm asking him one thing is that he can ultimately change our view of who the, who the son is if we have a skewed view of Christ. And what I'm talking about when I say a skewed view, because when we see Jesus, typically it is only a Jesus that loves us and that pushes us with mercy and grace, who's long suffering, who's tender mercies and is just gentle in all of his ways. But the more that I look at Jesus in this letter and within this book of Revelation, Jesus is not only all the things that I mentioned, but he's also a rebuker. And he's also one who chastises and lays out discipline. And I don't want us to view Jesus one-sided because that's a skewed view of who Christ is. Now, is he? a God of long suffering and kindness and gentleness and lowliness and meekness and power and love and grace and mercy and long suffering? Absolutely. But on the other end of that, there must be rebuke. There must be chastisement. There must be a level of discipline. 
Nobody can become a soldier. Nobody can become a Marine. Nobody can become a sailor. Nobody can become an airman without going through some type of basic training. Basic training is not only the thing that gets you in condition physically, but it, what it does at its root core is removes any bad civilian disciplines that you think or you're going to bring along to compromise the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, or the Marine Corps. Why? Because we're not going to have it. In fact, we will separate you, kindly shake your hand, and send you back to where you came from if you think that you can live and do what you want to do, because in order to be a Marine, an airman, a sailor, or a soldier, you must get with the program. And Jesus is saying, you are my church. Wake up. It is time that you get with the program. You, in fact, are the weapon that I have raised up. I feel like, I, I'm telling you, y'all pray for me. I'm about to explode up here. I'm about to implode. I don't even know the right word this morning. But Jesus is saying, listen, I'm trying to get your attention. It is time out for playing games. There is a real devil that I've already cast out. Revelation says what's going to happen to him. You don't have to trip. Yes, he has a level of power. Yes, he has a level of authority, but you are my bride and I am raising you up in this hour today to be the weapon that is going to defeat the satanic kingdom of darkness. Woe, Zion, get out of your sleep. Come out of your slumber. There is great work to be done in my name. And then comes the letter written to Laodicea. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever sang a song before and you love the song because of its beat, but you really honestly don't know all the lyrics? I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna be honest. I told you I'm transparent. I'm, 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 I keep it real, but I love bad boys. <laughs> and I, you know, and I sang it for years. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? Police, I'm gonna, hey, hey, police, I'm say, hey, hey, hey. Bad boys, bad boys, what you gonna do, right? And then one day, I go, let me actually find out what they're saying. Because ever since cops in the 90s, I have been Billy Manili in this thing and making up stuff that ain't in the song. And then when I find out what the lyrics are saying, I go, wow, man, I feel dumb. And this is kind of my, thank you, Holy Spirit, it's kind of what the church or the letter in Laodicea is. We, we think it says one thing, but in actuality, when we dig a little bit deeper and find out the heart of this letter and what Jesus is really saying, it's nothing what we think he's actually saying. That we've heard pastors and Bible teachers probably walk or make an attempt to walk through this letter, but it hasn't quite been clear that there's been, some, there's been some gaps, there's been some, some, I hate to call it false teaching, but just been some bad teaching. Probably pastors and Bible teachers with great godly intention, but just missing the lyrics a little bit. Still on beat, you know, but just not, not the right lyrics. So let's look at this letter, and I'm in the book of Revelation this morning, chapter three, beginning at verse one. I'm sorry. 14. That's next week. Verse 14, and the word of God says, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these thing says the amen, comma. Let's deal with the amen. Jesus is saying, I'm it. I am the final stamp. I am the 
Amen. I am, I am what closes and seals the deal. It would almost be like you going, man, today was just an awesome day. Did you not encounter the Lord Jesus Christ? And I go, amen. Praise the Lord. Like I typically do. And it's, and, and amen. It, 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 it seals the deal. It's, it's an affirmation. It is a confirming to know the amen. Like it is so. It is true. See, you did it right there. And Jesus is saying, I am the amen. I am the truth. In fact, anybody outside of me has the propensity to lie or be false. But in me, because I am the amen, I'm not only the beginning of the truth, I am the truth in the middle, and I am the amen that seals the truth in the end. In fact, Jesus says this when he has a, uh, somewhat of a contentious conversation with Brother Thomas in the Gospel of St. John chapter 14. Thomas, almost in a condescending and a very disrespectful way, tells Jesus in not so many words that you don't know where you're going. That Jesus is a, is a Lord who's walking around the earth without aim, without cause, like he's walking around aimless and Jesus, do you even know where you're going? And Jesus says, listen, not only do I know where I'm going, but I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. In fact, no one will ever come to the Father or get to the one that I go off in secret and pray to except through me. He is the amen. He seals the deal. He's a stamp of approval. He's the beginning, the end, and all between, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. He's Emmanuel, God with us. The bright and the morning star, the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley. This is him, the amen. I love this part. Please, I beg of you, if you like highlighting and taking notes in your Bible, and I encourage you to take notes because there's no way unless you just have a crazy anointed memory that you will be able to remember, but that you can go back to this. But I want you to underline faithful and true witness. There is power here that I do not want you to miss. And understand that you cannot be a witness with only truth and not faith, and on the flip side, be a witness with faith and no truth. That these two are conjoined together with a divine purpose. That I want you to highlight this, not only in your physical Bibles, but I want you to ask the Lord this morning to imprint this in your heart, that this can be a part of your prayer life, that when you get up, the next time that you pray and you open up your heart and you talk to a living God, he's not dead, he's much alive, and he, trust me, he wants to commune with creation and the children and the sons of God, and the next time that you talk to him in communion, I want you to ask him, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, make me a faithful and a true witness. Now I want you to be careful because he'll do it. I've done it. I've, I've prayed this before, so I'm not asking you to do something that I haven't already done, that I, that I still perpetually do even in my own private prayer life. But to show you that when Jesus is calling himself a faithful and a true witness, that Jesus being a faithful and true witness led him to the cross. That Jesus being a faithful and true witness was the thing that killed him. And that when you pray a prayer like, Father, in the name of Jesus, make me a faithful and true witness, it will destroy, it, you'll think it's destroying the, the good, but really what it's doing is it creates hate. People will start to say, man, we can't invite Brother Cliff to the barbecue. Everything's about Jesus. It's Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Don't He can't come to the party. He can't get no invite. Everything is God. And I'm telling you, listen, even when you are a faithful and true witness, it will even even get on the nerves of the people that you love and that are closest to you. 
faithful and true witness. You'll lose friends. You'll lose popularity. People will change their idea and their view of who they view you to be. Folks will deny who you are. They'll pretend in certain friend groups that they don't know you. When they ask about you, there is great weight that comes with being a faithful and true witness. But I'm telling you this morning, there is power in being a faithful and true witness of Jesus Christ. Let me show you what it does. Revelation chapter 11. And we will hear more about this in the weeks and the months to come. Revelation chapter 11. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod and the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God, the altar and those who worship there, but leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it. Jesus is very specific when it comes to billing anything in his name. Leave out the court for it has been given to the Gentiles. They will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. That's three and a half years, which is half of seven, which means there is a lack of completion because they only stopped at three and a half. And I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1,260 days. Clothed in what? Sackcloth, which when we go back to Revelation chapter three will make a little bit more sense. These are the two olive trees and the two what? Lampstands. What is Jesus doing right now? He's dealing with the seven lampstands, standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth. Man, what I will do to be a witness like this on the earth today. I got some folks I want to burn. Jesus, help me. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire, I need prayer in a desperate way, proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. This is Jesus Christ. These have power to shut up heaven so that no rain will fall in the days of their prophecy and they have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Jesus is giving them a divine supernatural authority like no other. Watch this in verse seven. When they finish their what? You overcome the devil by the blood of the lamb. Blood is a byproduct of the crucifixion. Jesus being crucified produced blood. That's why the devil and demonic principality don't like the blood because there's power in the blood. There's power in your testimony. I don't want to tell everybody about my testimony. I'm saying, you better stop. You better get it out there because as much as it is a testimony for what Jesus has done in your life, there's somebody somewhere near you that needs to hear what Jesus has done in your life. But look at the byproduct of being a faithful and a true witness. I'm not done. The beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will come and make war against these two witnesses and overcome them and get this, what will happen to them? He'll kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was what? These are the effects, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, of being a faithful and a true witness in Jesus Christ. It put Christ on a cross. Don't think it'll do anything different for you. You're not, it's, not, it's not about being popular. It's about being holy. It's not about being popular. It's about walking in righteousness. Are you listening this morning? Faithful and true witness. Back to Revelation chapter three. These things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, meaning that Jesus was the last Adam. What? The last Adam, his name's Jesus. What? No, he's the last Adam. Remember Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. Adam had to be given life to. 
Jesus is the last Adam, which is a life-giving spirit. Adam had to be created and life had to be breathed into body for him to become a living being. Jesus has always been different type of authority, different type of power. He is the last Adam according to the word of God. Are you listening? Faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. Listen to this, the so, the so famous statement of Christ in all of the letters written to the churches in Revelation. He says, I know your works. We can't get away from that. Why? I'm tired of hearing I know your works. No, 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 no. It goes deeper than that because this, again, when we dealt with the church in Thyatira, it described Jesus having eyes of fire and the mouth of, and the word of God is breathed out with power and authority from his mouth. He's talking about speaking forth the word, which means that Proverbs 15, three is a true word, a true verse. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. This talks about the omniscience and the all knowledge of Jesus Christ. And get this, Jesus is saying, not only do I know your works, I know the motivation associated with why you are working. Like, like, are you, are you, are you showing love to sister and brother to do it in front of others? So you can put a feather in your hat and so everybody can see, are you doing it because it's a paycheck or are you doing it because you just love the Lord and you're sold out for Christ and advancing his kingdom? I know your motivation. See, I see your works because I'm omnipresent, but because I'm omniscient, I know the motivation associated with why you're doing what you're doing. Hebrews 4.12 declares that the word of God is powerful. It is sharp, alive, quicker than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of soul and spirit and joints and the marrow. And, and, get this, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intention or the motivation of a man and a woman's heart. Jesus not only knows your works, but he knows what inspires you and what motivates you to do that very work. I know your works. And this is where we get bad boys, bad boys, right here. Because you go, I know your works. You are neither cold or hot. And Jesus says, I could wish you were cold or hot. And most of us have been taught or believe that Jesus is saying, be hot for me as a sign of be all in or, or be cold. Right? Like, like, just deny me, ignore me, go hard or go home. It's not what he's saying. And we know that's not what he's saying, first of all, because we don't see that anywhere in Scripture. And number two, Jesus is talking to the church. Why would he tell the church to turn his back on him, be totally cold, ignore me, either be hot or be cold? It's not. And for you to understand this, you've got to know the geography and the layout of what is going on. Laodicea is a city that is extremely wealthy. They have a lot of natural resource, but the one resource that they do not have is water. Are you with me? They have Heropolis which is 11 miles in one direction, which is a city that pumps hot calcified water from Heropolis to Laodicea. They have Colossae, which we get the book of Colossians. And even in Paul's address to the letter written to the church in Colossae, he mentions Laodicea. Go back and read the book of Colossians. So we have Heropolis, 11 miles in one direction, pumping hot, calcified, hot water that's used for medicinal purposes. And you then have in one direction, the city of Colossae that is pumping cold water from about five to six miles to the city of Laodicea for refreshing purposes. And we know cold's not bad because have you ever worked on a hot day in August in Western North Carolina. 
Cold is not bad. When I'm out there working, I am begging for heaven to drop a cold water on my head like manna because I'm about to die. My wife asked me the other day to cut some flowers so she could put them in the sunroom and in my mind and my body, I did it because I wanted to do it for her. But I was like, baby, in my mind, hurry up and pick these flowers because I'm about to die. It's 150,000 degrees out here. I'm thirsty. Cold water, yeah. Cold water is not bad. Cold water is refreshing. But think about this. If hot water, yes, God, if hot water from Heropolis filled with calcium is coming through 11 miles of filtration and piping, by the time it gets to the people in Laodicea, what do you think it is? It's lukewarm. There's no use for it. If you've got cold water coming six miles from Colossae into Laodicea, by the time it goes through all of that and gets to the people, it's what? Lukewarm. I've been on 30, 40 kilometer road marches. And when we start at the water buffalo at zero four in the morning, the water is ice cold. By the time I'm halfway, to the first side of 30 kilometers because I've got to do 40 pounds 30 kilometers back to where we started. There's nothing more disgusting than having water that's not cold when I, when I, when I remember when I got it 17 kilometers ago, it was freezing, it was refreshing. And now, if I don't know if you've ever done this and I don't recommend this, but if you've ever drank that type of water that's calcified with certain temperatures, it is vomit inducing. It will make you sick. And the church has been taught to believe that this is a, that this is a passion thing. Be hot for me, be intense for me. That this is a passion and an intensity thing. Well, this is a temperature thing. This is not passion. This is not intensity. It has nothing to do with temperature because the water could be hot and the water could be cold because what this has to do with is their distance from the source. Their distance from the source has created them to be lukewarm. And for some of you, you have become lukewarm in your mind, in your ways, your attitude, your giving, your servant. All you become lukewarm. Why? Because of your distance from the source. You've gotten so far. Church in Laodicea, church in Denver, church in Colorado, church in California, Japan. Y'all have become so far removed from the source that by the time you even get to me, you you have induced vomiting because you have not remained true to the identity in which I've created and called you to be. It's not temperature, it's not intensity, it's the distance from the source who is Christ Jesus. That's the problem. That's the issue. Then we go a little further. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Get this, verse 17, because you say, I'm rich. The church is saying this. Jesus is not saying that he's rich. He's saying what the Laodiceans are saying. Because if you say, I'm rich, I become wealthy, I have need of nothing, and I do not know. And get this, and do not know that you are actually wretched, you're actually miserable, you're actually poor, you're blind, and you're naked. Remember, Laodicea was very wealthy. And if you remember the letter in Thyatira, the reason they, they have accumulated a lot of their wealth is because they are compromised and a lot of the Christians in Laodicea are actually partnered with the local trade guilds. And they've got all types of gold. And Laodicea was known for black wool. They had the best medical centers, they had the Dukes, the, the Levines, they had the best of the very best when it came to medical centers. 
And if you know anything about the history here, it was somewhere theologians be believe between 60 and 61 años de many in the year of our Lord when they suffered a great earthquake that was so great that it destroyed the city of Laodicea. Because they were under the umbrella of the Roman Empire, Rome says, here, Laodicea, you, here's some funds. They were like a modern-day Red Cross or FEMA. And they went, hey, the earthquake has torn up the city. Here's money. Here's a resource. Here's everything you need to help rebuild and repair Laodicea. You know what Laodicea said? I'm straight. Thank you for your handout. Thank you for your EBT. Thank you for your food stamps. Thank you for all of what you want to give us to rebuild the city, but no thank you. We straight. We, 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 we Gucci. We good. We good on that. We good, bro. Like, we, we straight. We don't need that. And this is the attitude of a lot of Christians right here in America. Jesus says, your marriage is this close to having to stand before a judge in the court of public opinion or appeal to dissolve what God has brought together. And I, here I am standing with love, grace, and mercy, and truth to restore and reconcile, and yet you slap my hand away and say, I got it. Like, like Jesus reaching out like, I want to help you with raising children. I want to help you to be a better father, a natural father. I want to help you to be a better wife. I want to help you to be a better mother. I want to help you to be a better steward. I want to help you to be a better servant. And every time Jesus lends the help, he's better than FEMA. He's better than Red Cross. He is the great I am. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He knows every tree numbered in the forest and the has numbered on your head. He created you and formed you in your mother's womb and you've got the audacity when he reaches down from heaven to sin and instruct the Holy Spirit to open up your heart and transform you to tell him no I don't need you I'm good are you crazy I don't I, I, I don't need it I don't need your help Lord why do I need to go to the deepest place of prayer Lord in fact you stay on the throne and when, I, when I'm in trouble, Jesus, I'll call on you. And that may not be what you're saying literally, but you might as well say that because of the attitude that you've taken like the Laodiceans. I don't need to pray right now. Things are going great. I don't need to pray right now. I was delivered from sickness and disease and cancer and this and that. I'm, thank you. I'm good. Jesus healing the nine and only one shows back up. That, that's a true thing today. It's a true statement. That's where we are. We don't need it. Keep it, Lord. Thank you, but no thank you. I'm rich. I don't, and he says, no, you're not. You're wretched. You're wretched. You're miserable. Yeah, you have a lot of material stuff, but Jesus says, I can, I, in a twinkling of an eye, I can take all that from you. I can dry all that up. That bank account, I'll dry it up. It's mine anyway. That job that I gave you to, that you prayed for, to me in one season, but forget about me in the next, I'll shut the door. Read Psalm 75 and 6. I'll raise up another. Promotion doesn't come from where? The east or the west nor the south, but from God that sits down one and raises up another. He'll shut the door. You're miserable. You're poor. You're blind. You cannot see. You're naked. Why is this important? Because again, they are known for their medical centers in Laodicea and they were known for treating eye diseases and optometrists and they had an eye salve that would, they would put on the patients of those that were losing sight and had trouble seeing. So this is why he's talking about this. And then in verse 18, he says, Jesus says, I would counsel you to buy from me because my gold is refined in the fire. That stuff you got down on there, down there, you put around your neck and put on your fingers, it's cute. But the stuff I got is different. It's refined. It's pure. It's got no imperfections. It ain't melted with a bunch of other stuff. Yes, God 
It, it doesn't lace itself with, with, with bad. It, it, it's not, it, you know, because a lot of these jurors, and I'm going to put a lot of them on blast, you think it's gold when they put the gun on it and they put it under the meter and they scratch it and they give it, they put it under the light and give the litmus test. But a lot of that stuff has copper in it. Some of that stuff, I call it baloney gold. Because if you like baloney, it's got a lot of different stuff in there. Matter of fact, come talk to me after service. I grew up with baloney. It ain't what you think. It's got a lot of stuff in there. You be like, Lord, have mercy. Father, never again in Jesus' name. But Jesus says, listen, I, I, I need you to, I need you to, my gold. My gold, buy, buy from me. Get my gold. My gold different. My gold is shine. He's talking about witness. My, my gold is you're walking to a dark place on your job and in your home and you, you, people will begin to suspect that you, you walk different and you live different. They, they'll start asking you questions like, how can you be so happy? How can you be so joy? Where does that come from? And you can be able to tell them, come on worship, you can be able to tell them, I've been refined because the one that I get my gold from is the faithful and the true witness. He says that you may be rich in white garments. Why white garments? Because again, Laodicea, they were known for their black wool. Black wool. And putting on the white garments is a representation of putting on the holiness of Christ. To putting on a new person with a new mindset with a new heart. Then he says that, you, that now you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and now you can anoint your eyes with eye salve. Going back to Laodicea's medical prowess. And now when you can do these things, Jesus says, you can see now. I can see clearly now the Sin is gone. I'm in a singing mood this morning. I went from bad boys to whatever that is. Watch out. Like, I can see clearly now. I can testify this morning there is nothing like being able to see clear. And they call you, they call you crazy. No, I ain't crazy. God has me in a place now, I can see the enemy as he's trying to come now. I can see him. I can see him when he's trying to get on my children. I can see him when he's trying to get in my home. I can see him when he's trying to get on the saints. I can see when he's trying to come against his church. Thank you, Jesus, for putting an anointed eye salve on my eyes now. I can see a little bit different now. Everybody else is seeing on the level of Laodicea, but I can see what you see now. And I can't see as deep as you can. You have a foreknowledge and an ability to see the thing in the end at the beginning. I don't have that type of sight, but thank God that I see more clearly now, that I see different now, that I value the word different than when I first got saved, that I value worship and I see worship different. I see people different. People used to get on my nerves in 2009 when I was called to be a preacher, even I was called at 15. I denied Jesus until 27. Jesus showed up in my life and I struggled with people because people got on my nerves I know your favorite pastor won't say that but I will and I go man how can they be so old with so much life experience but be such a babe in Christ it annoys me I want to deal with it. I want to deal with people let me just preach the word on Sunday and teach Bible study and go home and Jesus says no not only was that not me but that's not Bible and that's not what I've called you to do and you've got to be able to deal with people in the worst of ways. And the only way you can deal with people right where they are in the worst of ways is having this eye salve. Because when you have this type of eye salve on your eyes, you don't see people in their wickedness and their shame and in their nakedness. You see them the way Jesus sees them, which is saved, delivered, set free, their identity in Christ, their future, the hope and the expectant in Jeremiah 29 and 11. But if you see them in 
any different way, you're in trouble. And Jesus says, as many as I love, get this, I told you in the very beginning when we started this thing, that you can't view Jesus in a skewed manner that he's more than just love, grace, mercy, kindness, and long suffering. Jesus says out of his own mouth, as many as I love, I do two things. I'll do what? I rebuke and I chasten. As much as you cry out for the love and for the grace and the mercy, this is next level Christianity. This is going beyond the ABCs of the faith and nothing against the ABCs and the basic training of the faith. But I'm in a place in my personal walk where the ABCs just don't do it for me like it used to do when I first got saved. That next level Christianity is not only praying for the love and the grace and the mercy. Lord, give me a new job. Give me a better house. Give me the children and my life. Give, give, give me, the, give me, give me, give me. This is next level because this goes, Jesus, I'm praying that you rebuke and chasten anything between head and heart that misrepresents you and does not bring your name glory. This is next level faith. And if you pray this prayer, I promise you Jesus will do it, but I warn you, it's very uncomfortable. It exposes the inner depths of your heart that you've been hiding, that you have a good capability of hiding from most people. It brings, it brings a lot of, there's, there's, some, there's some things that go on. People might actually know the real you. But even in the real you being exposed, there's real power and real love and real grace that'll meet you on the other side through rebuking the chastisement of Jesus Christ. You gotta walk through this. This is the perfecting of our faith. This is taking us from maturity, from one, from glory to glory like Paul was preaching. This is next level. And most of us out of fear will say, I will never pray that, Pastor Cliff. And I'll tell you, you'll ne that's your attitude, I'll never pray that. Then you can expect to remain the same. Because a part of the sanctifying process and the reshaping of who you are, it's wrapped in the chastisement and rebuking of an omniscient and an omnipresent and an all-knowing and loving seeing God. Behold, verse 20, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens up the door, I will come in with him and dine him and he with me. Verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus is talking about overcoming all of what the cross brought. Imagine this being a modern day electric chair because that's what it was. It was a death sentence. And there's a double invitation here because most pastors will use this as an attempt to open up the invitation to discipleship for somebody to be saved. But let me exegete the text and go just a little bit deeper than your understanding of what you think the Word of God is saying. Jesus is talking to the church. They are in Laodicea and there is a double invite. Jesus is saying on one end, I will invite you to sit on the throne with me. But I also want you to let me in the place that I belong. That as much as we preach and teach and believe that Jesus is standing outside of the door knocking of your heart, he's standing outside the doors of the church and knocking saying, let me in. Like I know you, People know you are church because there's a 40 foot cross that hangs on your property. People know that you are church because it says Emmanuel Church. People know that it's a church because of your social media footprint. But if the truth be told, Jesus is saying, I'm not even invited in the place that you call church. You don't preach the cross. You don't preach me. You don't preach the gospel of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1, 2, and uh, 3, and 4. There's no power there. There's no freedom there. There's no liberty there. There's no demonstration of my authority. And I'm standing outside of the doors of your church saying, let me in because people don't see or encounter me. Let me in. And then I think about it, and this hurts me because I go, man, 
Jesus, I hope that's not you with Emmanuel standing outside of the door knocking, begging to come in because there are people that you want to touch, save, deliver, and set free. Then I go a step further and say, man, I wonder how many assemblies, how many ecclesias, how many governing bodies right here just in America does Jesus stand outside the door of every Saturday begging to get in? Why? Because everything inside points to self-reliance and self-righteousness. And this, my friends, was the kryptonite and the death nail to the church in Laodicea. And if this was the kryptonite and the death nail to the church in Laodicea, it would be to the churches here in America. To think that you are self-reliant enough and self-righteous enough that you don't need Jesus. We don't need to preach the gospel. We got enough money in the bank to build. We got enough tithes. We got enough offerings. We got enough rock stars on the worship team. We got an awesome pastor who can preach and orate the word of God. Jesus, thank you, but no thank you. We are self-reliant enough. We straight. We good. And here Jesus is standing outside of the door knocking, begging to come in. It's a double invitation. Jesus said, listen, if you invite me into my house, which I'm the head of, I'm the groom, you're the bride. And if you can withstand and last the evil days, salvation, endure, be being saved. Why? Because you saved me as I'm being saved, life now, to one day ultimately be saved, eternity, to be being saved. And because I'm here now, we can share the throne together. What a promise. of the knock of Christ pastors this is my message to all shepherds all church leaders let Jesus in don't let the house just be a, a house with good music social club type gatherings and going home with no change no power no soundness of mind no transformation Jesus is knocking and he wants to come in and then he says in verse 22, he who has an ear, and that's women too, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I don't ever want to hear from the saints, Jesus ain't speaking. You're just not listening. Because he's got a lot to say to the church. Why? Because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Keep your hand this morning to the plow. And I'm asking you as much, I'm trying to catch everybody in the eyeballs. Keep your hands on the plow. Don't look back. Jesus says for one even look back, he's not fit for the kingdom of God. Don't look back. You looking back is a sign that you're not faithful enough to believe God for where the plow is being taken. If you've got to look back, then you're saying, Jesus, I don't believe you in the capability of you taking us where you said you're going to take us. Don't look back. Keep your hands on the plow. As tough as things may get and as difficult as things may become, it's all right. Greater is he that lives in you and I than he that is in the world. Come on and say amen. Standing all over the room. Thank God for his word and his presence. And my hope and my prayer is that you see this letter addressed to the church in Laodicea a, a bit different now. That you begin to value the words of Christ and to understand the promise and the prophecy of things to come. Jesus has never failed. Are you listening? Jesus has never never failed he will not fail us now keep your hope your faith in him regardless of how wicked and dark the hour grows we have been called to be the light set on the hill that shines all in the midst of darkness let the Lord use you in this hour don't be like the church of Laodicea self-reliant and self-righteous we need God when things are going great we need them even more 
I know we've been taught to believe we only need them when all hell is broken loose. Now you need them when, when all hell has not broken loose because hell being broken loose is probably somewhere right around the corner. So I would encourage you this morning to stay in the deepest place of prayer and to know that Jesus says that when you go into a room, close the door behind you, pray to your father and the one that sees what you do in secret, not hears your prayer, but sees you praying will be the same God that will reward you openly. Let us pray this morning as we prepare for worship. Father.